right, so welcome Good to see everybody out there today. I want to welcome you to Golden Rules for First-Time Managers that will improve your organizational performance. I am Kelly Tinnen. I am the owner and primary consultant of Kelly Tinnen Consulting, an employee engagement and organizational development consulting firm located here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I want to take you through some golden rules for first-time managers, really three key points today that I believe will help you improve your organizational performance and help your teams be more engaged, therefore improving your company's return with your relationships and your return on your investment. Question for you, when you think about leadership, what does it look like? What do you think of? Does it look like this? No, uh, it's more organized more more controlled structured structured okay yeah absolutely some structure what about your teams when you think about your teams do teams sometimes look like this yeah they can they can right do they sometimes look like this oh yeah like most tired. of the time <laughs> most of the time tired disengaged maybe lacking that motivation what about frustration oh yeah and what happens when your team's frustrated, when your team maybe is lacking some motivation, is disengaged? Lack of productive tip, productivity. Yeah, no uh, collaboration. Yeah, lack of productivity. There's no collaboration. What can happen when we have no collaboration among our team? We become kind of siloed, right? Everybody's yeah. ideas kind of happen in that vacuum for to kind of use a cliche term here. And people right. become frustrated and it becomes like a cycle. We get frustrated. We become more disengaged. We become more tired. We become less motivated. And then we become more frustrated. And then we look for other places to work. <laughs> and then yes. that's when, yeah, that's when our team members may start to look for other places to work, other places where they can be engaged and be motivated. Did you know that only 20% of employees, leaders make them feel good about the future? Well, wow, that's really well. Surprising, right? And we'll look at a couple of these stats today. And, and they, they were all kind of shocking to me. So that means, what does that mean? 80% of employees are out there not feeling good about the future, their future in the workplace, their future in their role. So what perspective does that give you in your own role or looking at an organization? If we have 80% of people who aren't really feeling good about their day-to-day -day work, aren't really feeling good about how they're managed, what, what does that mean? It means that there's no engagement. Yeah, there's no engagement, right? They're not engaged in their work. They're not doing their best because maybe they don't feel like their best is prom is promoted right. or recognized or rewarded. And so this really can do a lot of things for an organization. It can stifle innovation. You've got people, you turnover, your turnover can increase. An increase in safety issues or other types of issues, waste issues in terms of production. What could happen if we could turn the needle, let's say, and just turn that needle slightly, even 10%. The gains, I think, could be really huge. Specifically, when it comes to leaders, we were talking about here, um, the 20%, the percentage of employees who feel that leaders make them feel good about the future. What if I told you even at improving the skills of your leader. So as a leader, honing your own leadership skills could have that impact on your team to help your team find more success. Sometimes it's not just about the people on our team, but it's looking inward and reflecting and saying, okay, what can I do to maybe improve my skills to help me better lead my team? What might that look like? I have some stats, some more stats for you. I'm, I'm a stat nerd by nature. I can't help it. But I've been in a lot of positions where I have had some, I have had some great leaders. I have had some not great leaders. Again, another, another interesting statistic, 80% of people do not feel that their manager motivates them to do outstanding work. And 21% are not engaged in their day-to-day -day work. So we have nearly a quarter of people who are just not engaged day to day. And we know already, you guys have said it, this means reduced ROI, increased safety issues, service issues, a disjointed culture. So people kind of out 
out there on an island, dismal quality. So what if leaders were armed with those skills and knowledge they needed to help their teams be motivated, enjoy their jobs more? On the big picture, this would help reduce issues, improve culture, and really would move everyone towards working on the mission of the organization. So one of the things that I do and I'm going to talk about is I help teams develop these skills, sustainable leadership through programs that will improve employee engagement. I've helped many teams like yours work through states of frustration, low motivation, and disorganization to help them become more engaged and productive. And I haven't done this alone. I have had some awesome mentors, like really awesome mentors who have helped me along the way. One of those mentors is Bridget Gilbert. So I have permission to to mention her by name, but Um, Bridget has been an amazing mentor for me. She was a boss of mine many, many years ago and remains a good friend to this day. And the thing about Bridget is she always sees the positive in people, including myself, and has been there to pick me up when I needed that hand to be picked up. And I, I still remember to this day something that she said to me. We were working on a project and I was really frustrated. I was really upset because there had been a mistake and I had made a mistake. And I, I was really beating myself up about this particular mistake. And she looked at me dead in the eyes and she said to me, you know, Kelly, you have to stop. She said, of all the people that I know, you beat yourself up worse than anybody I have ever met. And you have to you have to stop. So it's funny to this day, I still hear her voice in the back of in the back of my head saying those sorts of things. And she, and she always just just has really positive advice uh, that has really been helpful for me throughout my career, even when I haven't worked for her anymore. Now this person I never met, Obviously, it's Lucille Ball, for those of you that don't know. I admire Lucille Ball for her tenacity, for her strength, and for her business savviness. I, first of all, think she was probably or is probably one of the best actresses to this day that I have ever seen on TV. But aside from that, a lot of people don't know her business savviness. She was one of the first women, well, she was, I think, the first woman to own a production studio in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And in fact, she had Desilu Studios with her husband at the time, Desi Arnaz, and they actually bought out and acquired um, RKO Pictures. She went on to buy Desi Arnaz out upon their divorce, and she ran the company for many, many years. And so, and it produced programs like Star Trek, I Love Lucy, among other things. And so I admire her for being a woman leader at a time when it was not comfortable or it, and it was not common for women to be strong personalities and strong leaders in a big organization. And then my last one here is uh, my good friend and mentor, Keith, Keith Powell. And I admire Keith because first of all, he's very self-aware. He knows what he knows and he knows what he doesn't know and isn't afraid to seek out information, which I, I think is a wonderful trait. He's not afraid to ask questions and to seek out information. But also the thing that he does that I think is really valuable is when he communicates with people, he creates this really safe environment to give people honest feedback. Um, And to be able to share sometimes feedback that may be, I don't want to say critical in a bad way, but he frames it in such a way that it's that it's very that it's coming from a place of wanting you to be better in a place of caring. And I think that that's just really a valuable skill to have. And so again, I have had many, many mentors and, and people who have helped me along the way, but these are three people that really stand out to me and have helped me. So I want to encourage you to think about what mark are you leaving on some of your team and how are how are you impacting some of your team members? So I've mentioned a lot of leadership traits that these mentors have had for me. Although there are many many traits. The three that really stand out to me, not just necessarily for first time managers, but for anybody are transparency. Now, transparency does not mean I'm going to tell you everything. But what transparency means is I'm being clear and open in my communication about processes and nuances that are involved that involve my team members. So I'm not keeping my team members in the dark. And in fact, is it appropriate for me to involve them in some of these decisions? Because it may impact them But they may also have ideas on how to make something better because they are in it every day and it's top of mind for them. And as leaders, 
sometimes we just have a different set of glasses on. It doesn't make it bad. It just means we're looking at things through a different lens. So I think transparency is is huge. Lack of transparency, if we think of this as a stool, if we pulled out one of the legs, it diminishes trust. It diminishes psychological safety, which we'll talk about here in a bit. Psychological safety is really just the ability, it's a fancy word, it's the ability to share our thoughts and ideas safely. If you're interested in exploring, there is a Harvard professor, her name is Amy Edmondson, and she has studied the phenomenon of psychological safety. And she's written several books on it. One of them is the book called Teaming, which I have read. She shares some concrete examples in organizations about what good psychological safety can do for a team and what no psychological safety can do for a team. And one of the examples that she shared was the Challenger space shuttle in the 80s that that exploded. When the space shuttle was being developed, there was an engineer who was expressing concerns over an O-ring issue. Now, I'm not an engineer, my husband is, so I, I don't build things for a living, but but it was it was an o, it was an O-ring issue. He went to his leadership and essentially was told, shut up. Like we're moving forward. Basically, we have too much time. There's too much politics. There's too much invested in this not to give it the green light. Peace out, basically, is what they said. Well, we know what the result was. It was catastrophic. And we can relate that today, I think, to the to the Titan sub that that just imploded, not exploded, but imploded under sea. And we're starting to find out because of potentially some safety issues. They asked that engineer, well, why didn't you speak up? And he had said, well, I just like, I didn't have the, I didn't have the authority. I didn't have the power. I didn't have the authority. Nobody was listening. And therefore that diminishes trust that pulls that leg out from the stool. Trust, I think is really foundational in leader relationships to be able to not just trust your leader, but for your leader to be able to trust your team. These things like transparency, psychological safety help to build trust. But we can see that trust is lacking in a lot of organizations. Only 21% of employees trust the leadership in their organization. Again, going back to that model, what what could we do if we turn the needle just 10%? So this means that 80% of people don't trust the leadership in their organization. They don't have this foundational piece in their triangle. They don't have this foundational piece of their stool. They essentially have a leg missing. What is that doing to the outputs in your organization, whether it be services that you provide, products that you provide? So we talked about this. Again, how do we build more transparency? It doesn't mean full disclosure. It means clear and open communication. So again, are we going to our team to ask them for their input? Are we going to our customers asking for their input as we change and implement processes? The interesting thing is I also follow a lot of Adam Grant, who's an organizational psychologist, and he wrote the book called Think Again. And he said many of us will will team up with people who are are, for lack of a better term, agreeable. He didn't use these terms exactly, but who will tell us how great something is. And he said, I want people on my team who will say, "Mm, no, I don't know about that because it forces us to think about things differently and make them better and to see things in a way that we haven't seen them before. So being transparent not only helps build that trust, but is it also helping us be more innovative? So think about And you don't have to answer out loud, but how can you or how can your organization improve practices to be more transparent? Are there issues with transparency right now that are creating a little bit of fear, that are creating a lack of trust or a disjoint in trust? And how can we help to improve practices to be be more transparent? Are these things as a leader that maybe we need to work on? Do we need to ask our team about it? Maybe we need to ask our team, hey, do you think I'm transparent when we when we are going through these particular processes? Are you kept in the loop? We mentioned psychological safety, the ability to share thoughts and ideas safely, and the ability to give everybody a seat at the table. Again, we're not creating a space where we're oversharing, right. but being vulnerable. It's okay as leaders to not have all the answers. It's okay as leaders to be afraid. We how are we going to express that to our team? But how are we going to let them know, you know what? Yeah, I'm a little unsure as well. 
but I'm going to be confident in the decisions that I make and we're going to move forward together. And I'm, and I'm going to, I'm going to help us all through this. We're going to all get through this. Making sure everyone has a seat at the table. So oftentimes in meetings, this is just a good example because everyone's been in a meeting before. Everyone's been in a meeting before that they don't want to be in. Sometimes the quiet people have ideas to share. And we've all been in meetings where we have one person who is sharing all of the ideas, including what they've had for lunch, what they did this past weekend, everything. And that's okay. People get passionate. I, I, myself included, you get passionate about something and then you're excited and you're talking. But has everybody been given a seat at the table and a chance to share? People aren't diminished for their thoughts, for their fears, and for their ideas. How can we make it safe on our teams to share mistakes and ideas? Some other things to think about. The old adage in communication, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. But it is true, we do have two ears and one mouth, but it is important to listen and active listening is a part of fostering that psychological safety, is a part of fostering trust. How are we going to make sure that we're actively listening to what people are sell- to saying? And maybe that's being mindful about asking certain questions, asking questions like why, asking questions like, tell me more about that. Taking time to respond again in the immediate kind of the immediate culture that we have of today, we feel like we have to have a an answer to everything and b that we have to respond right away. But take a breath, take a couple of seconds to respond or say, let me dig into that and get back to you. Give me some time to get back to you on that. Not chastising a team member. So thinking back to that challenger example, that team member was chastised and they he was really shamed into his thoughts and pushed and pushed into a corner with catastrophic results. So not chastising somebody, especially in public in front of their peers for expressing concerns, expressing challenges. And another tip that comes from one of my favorite thought leaders, uh, Scott Miller, who used to be with Franklin Covey. He wrote a book called Management Mess to Leadership Success. And and it's, it's a great book. It's a short read. It's an easy read, very relatable. He gives examples from his own life, um, which I think are really relatable. It makes you think, oh, good. I'm not the only one who's ever made these mistakes before. But he talks about, yeah, Keith has got the book there. Um, Andy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a great book. He talks about and I actually do this about how when people were talking to him, he would bite the inside of his lip so that he wouldn't be inclined to interrupt them and it would give him time to think about a response. So I'll bite the inside of my lip sometimes. Hopefully it's not noticeable to people, but I'll bite the inside of my lip to give people the space to be able to share and to keep me from interrupting. The other thing to remember is we list or we hear in information much slower than we speak information. So we hear information at something like 150-ish words per minute, but we speak something like 400 words per minute. So there's also a gap there. So we have to help us build in exercises to help us be conscious. And then you add in all of the daily interruptions and everything. And it's no wonder anybody hears anything. The last piece here I want to talk about is self-awareness. Self-awareness is the ability to reflect on your own values, to reflect on your own skills, and to recognize when you need to lean on your team. The funny thing is, is I was talking to somebody actually that I ran into at a restaurant the other day, and we were talking about, um, he, he taught at the School of Management for a while and was saying how he made all of his students do teamwork because that's how you operate in life is everything that you do involves some sort of team. So when we have people on our team, remembering we're not the smartest people in the room and our team members have different skills than us and see things through different glasses just because of life experiences, how can we leverage that? So think about how you can leverage and lean on your team. Who has skills that maybe you want to improve? Who has knowledge about an area that maybe can help your team grow or dive into a different type of of project venture? Self-awareness is really being aware of what your own skills are, but also being aware of, hey, I don't know everything. It's okay. How how can I leverage and su- the support of the people around me to help move the organization forward? I think in today's culture, I think not just employees are craving it, but I think the workplace is really demanding this shift in what leadership looks like. And we often think of it as a hierarchy. The leader is here. 
and the employees are underneath. But I think we're really seeing a shift to where everyone is on the same, the same playing field, moving that train forward on the track. So how can we lean in, lean on our team and leverage our team's skills? So by a show of hands, how many of you are ready to help your employees love the work that they do? How many of you are interested in learning how a few simple steps can really shift your culture and engagement among your teams, and then therefore your company. And what if I told you in just a few hours, we can customize an intervention that will shape the future and drive the future of your company. So I'm here to help your team move forward in that endeavor. Imagine what your team could accomplish if they had the knowledge and skills to help them be better in their roles. And then maybe we had some different knowledge and skills to help us empower our teams to be the best people that they can be in their jobs, but also to be the best people that they can be in their careers. I often say, and and I really do mean it, I I think our job as leaders is not just to be a leader within an organization and move people forward, but to help those on our team be the best people that they can be, grow their skills, to match them with roles that that they, things that they want to learn about to help them be the best that they can. And so to help us do that, I'm hosting a leading from within mini mastermind. So this is going to be a small group six spots. And together, what I will, what we will do is I have a pre-session assessment that I will send out that will help you tap in to some of these thoughts and, and something, uh, some of the challenges and even good things, benefits that are, are coming from your organization. We'll do a one hour and 45 minute mini mastermind session via Zoom. And then you'll have a two week follow up call with me as your facilitator. What you're going to gain from attending are strategies tailored to your workplace, not just some standard strategies, but things that actually can be implemented at your workplace. You'll have mentoring and accountability because there will be individuals that you'll be participating with. And so not only will you have some support from me, but you'll have support from other people that will be attending the sessions with you and holding you accountable. And you'll have true support from those that have been there. I've been there. The individuals in the session have been there as well. And so you'll have support from everybody there. And also we'll have different ideas and and different initiatives that will spark from this session that you'll be able to implement in your workplace to make some immediate changes. So if you sign up today, or actually I should say by June 30th, which is Friday, you will receive 25% off. So your investment for this will only be $225 plus tax. I have to pay, have to pay the government. This will guarantee your spot. And with this, I'm also looking for some ambassadors for the course that complements this mini strategy session. And that is a self-paced course, Becoming a Leader, Golden Rules for First-Time Managers. So I'm looking for a few ambassadors to take this course. It's a $350 value that I will be giving to you, free investment. And you'll be able to take that course. You'll be able to help hone in some of your, uh, your knowledge and skills, work through some of your leadership skills, have some reflective questions, and different things that many first-time leaders face. Not even first-time leaders, but any leader faces at some point in their career, it will help you grow in your skill set. So with that, will I see you there? Do you have any questions?